Hey everyone, welcome to this podcast called Ken Reads, where I, Ken, read out your letter that you've shared with me in the hopes that I can better help you understand what the F just happened between you and the last partner you were dating, whether it was in a relationship or a situationship. I look at these experiences from the lens of attachment theory. I don't just come up with thought terminating cliches like they're just not that into you or if they wanted to, they would. While some of those phrases might have their benefit in other dynamics, I try and look at this from the lens of is there perhaps an insecure attachment issue that's at play in these particular dynamics? And though I am an Australian counsellor, I am not someone who is going to be responding to these letters as if I was with a client. I'm here to provide validation, yes, but I can't provide any diagnoses on these. So even if, you know, a lot of people might understandably hear this and be like, well, that sounds like a narcissist. At best, I'll probably say, sounds a bit narky. I probably won't go any further than that out of respect to my ethical boundaries in regards to what I can and can't do. If you find this of benefit to you, fantastic. That's what I want. And if you want to submit your letter, you're very welcome to once there is obviously availability per month. And I'll happily read out and share my own two cents as to what I think has gone on in your dating experience to offer you a sense of validation for what you've been through and also to give other people listening a chance to feel like maybe this relates to what they've also experienced as part of collective healing. So with that all out of the way, let's dive in to the latest letter. This latest letter comes in from Susan and Susan writes, first, thank you so much for your work. You're most welcome. You've been very helpful in my healing post breakup with someone who I believe has a severe, fearful avoidant attachment that leans dismissive. This is my first rodeo. I've never heard of attachment theory and had no clue this was even a thing. I'm going to take a little pause here to say there is something uniquely painful about being on the receiving end of someone who leans with a fearful avoidant attachment, sorry, who is a dismissive, leaning, fearful, avoidant attachment style. It can be really brutal on a lot of people and don't get me wrong dismissives and fearfuls you know in and of themselves when they're not working on their stuff painful as can anxious attaches but there is something about the dismissive leaning fearful avoidant that can be downright just really brutal because of the way they tend to boomerang back in and out of people's lives and can be very invalidating anyways let's get on with susan's letter some background I met Benny completely organically during the process of building my home. We got to know each other as friends first. On the last day of the project, he was hanging around, seemingly not wanting to leave, and eventually threw out, we should go and have a beer sometime, to which I agreed. I had plans to travel for months. He did text me while I was traveling, and I'd said I'd reach out upon my return. Now, I was reluctant because he's 16 years my junior, but eventually I did. His childhood was horrific. Here we go. A mother who neglected him, a father who was not in the picture. His mother moved them to the US, leaving the father in Europe, and a stepfather who severely punished, who severely physically abused him to the point he thought he was going to die on more than one occasion. Jesus. He spent a lot of his teenage years in juvenile detention for fighting back. I want to take this moment to say I am very sorry for Benny because no one deserves to go through an experience like that. Although something tells me that his history, whilst it explains his behaviour, is probably not going to be an excuse for what comes up next. Susan continues, we started dating exclusively right from the start. Looking back now, I wonder um, who he discarded when he was busy love bombing me. He did love bomb me. I just didn't know what that was at the time. I thought I just met the most amazing guy. I felt like Taylor and I had just met my Travis. He has two small boys and we were together on his off nights with the kids. He basically lived at my house when he didn't have the boys. It was really important to me to take things slowly, especially with the kids, because I wanted to make sure he and I had a strong foundation before bringing them into the mix. Good on you. I did all, I did do the things with them, like creating dinners and outings occasionally. And they even spent the night at my house a few times um, along with their father 
And even though we were just friends, they knew we were more than that. Benny's ex, the boy's mother, cheated on him, moved in with the guy um, and ended up marrying him. I was with Benny when they got married and he seemed to be okay with it. But now I wonder if he really was. We were still in the honeymoon phase at this time. From my perspective, the relationship was good. We never had any fights. And during the last few months, I felt like he became quite distant. But I thought it was just work and child stress and the typical ups and downs in any relationship. Looking back, he did present some hot and cold behavior at times. Sometimes he would walk in and give me, um, he'd give me a movie star kiss. Sometimes he would talk on his phone throughout dinner like I wasn't even there. I didn't think much of it at the time, but I did believe that relationships couldn't always be like a movie. And at times I felt like this was jarring because on one hand it felt that way, yet on the other it felt like it was anything but. He did say many times throughout the relationship that he felt overwhelmed. But when I asked if I could do something to help, he never elaborated. Generally, this was when he had the kids, so I chalked it up to that. The weekend of my birthday, he asked me if I saw us moving in together. My response was, nah, not right now, based on my work obligation, which was 14 hour days. Whoa. It was literally a one minute conversation. We went to a nice dinner on Sunday. Monday morning, he left my house as usual with a hug, kiss, I love you, and I never saw him again. I called him Tuesday from a work dinner and he was clearly not interested in hearing from me. I texted him to let him know I had made it home and asked if he cared. This led to a series of texts saying he tried so hard but couldn't do it anymore. Of course. He didn't know what he wanted out of life anymore. We're both really busy and he doesn't um, think he has the time for a relationship. I don't take him seriously. He doesn't think I want to be a stepmom to his boys. We met at a difficult time. He doesn't think he is what I need. He, I'm going to repeat this one. He doesn't think he can give me what I want or need. He said he's fighting his own demons. He needs to figure out how to let go of the past. Oh, Jesus Christ. This all came out of the blue for me. I had no idea he was feeling any of this. So I pressed for more of an explanation via text. And I received. I had a picture of my ex on the bar in the basement. We never spent time there. It wasn't finished. Nor do I know that it bothered them. I didn't, um, oh, sorry, let me re-clarify that. Um, I had a picture of my ex on the bar in the basement. And then Susan writes, we never spent time there. It wasn't finished, nor did I know that it bothered him. Makes more sense. Uh, Susan continues, um, he had apparently said, I didn't update my social media to say I was in a relationship, which made him think I wasn't serious. Oh, right. So he's saying, um, because you didn't update your social media status, that made him think you weren't serious, even though, as you point out, you don't care about social media. He felt like a quote unquote hidden boyfriend. I had not introduced him to my parents. They live in another state, but I should have and would have if I knew it bothered him. Yeah, well, fair enough. We didn't go out enough with our friends if and when we did because it was I because, yeah, English. If when we did, it was because I planned it. Apparently, I didn't want a future with him, even though I was very into him. And he always came to my house. He did say via text that he didn't want to continue the relationship when I pressed him about it. And then went into, I know I'm fucked up. I panic and run from problems. It's a defense mechanism. I've shut down completely. I don't think I'll ever be happy in my life. I don't know how to deal with problems. I'm a piece of shit. I just need time to deal with my past. Oh, Jesus Christ. I tried to give him space. I told him I was there for him and that he did not have to go through this alone. I told him I loved him and asked him to please not shut me out. He responded that he loved me too and was sorry for not communicating. I checked on him via text every few days. Sometimes he would respond with, I'm okay, just busy. Other times, no response. He would not take my calls. After a month of this, I then asked if he would meet me somewhere and if he was ever going to talk to me again. I got a vague response saying he enjoyed our time together but did not see any benefit for us to meet again. Far out. I asked three different times for him to mail me back my house keys. He said he would, but never did. Yep. He basically left my house on that last morning and vanished out of my life completely. He blocked me on social media about two weeks after he left. And about three months, I learned that he, um, his ex was pregnant. 
I now assume she told him the weekend of my birthday based on the timing. After about six months, I learned that he was in a relationship that started two weeks after he discarded me. As far as I know, he is happy as a clam and planning his future with her. Jesus Christ. Okay. <laughs> There's a lot here. Firstly, Susan, I am really sorry that you've gone through this because this is sounding like a whirlwind from hell. And combined with that, there was obviously a lot of intensity when you were working on your home in the beginning. So let's take the clock back a bit. It seems to me that this is someone who has a lot of trauma. Benny's obviously gone through a lot. And like I said earlier, I am sorry that he's gone through a lot of this. It does seem to me like he hasn't actually worked through any of his, you know, wounding. And it suggests to me that he's also got a lot of serious childhood stuff that's preventing him from actually falling in love and also committing to a proper relationship. And it looks like he hasn't resolved any of this stuff with his ex. I agree with your assessment. I do think he's a dismissive, leaning, fearful, avoidant because there are a few things here which are very distinctive for someone who's more of a fearful avoidant than a dismissive. Dismissives, generally speaking, have what we would describe as a superficial self-esteem. They're not the kind of people who would ever declare that they, you know, that they're fucked up or that they've never been happy in their life. They usually convince themselves that everything's totally fine. They tend to minimize their own problems and think, yeah, everything's normal in my life. Fearful avoidance, on the other hand, not so much. They tend to have low, 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 low self-esteem and they're not ashamed to admit it. And they're often very self-deprecating. So with regards to a fearful avoidant attacher, saying things like, I know I'm fucked up, I panic and run from problems, it's a defense mechanism, you have low self-esteem mixed with a justification. You've also got him saying, I don't think I'll ever be happy in my life, which to me is a real clear indicator of victimhood. And him saying, I'm a piece of shit, I don't know how to deal with problems. This is a guy who's being a baby. He's being a baby and can't handle the consequences of his actions. And the fact that he also, and there's something else that also is very distinctively fearful avoidant that is not the same as a dismissive. Some of his justifications for the breakup include how apparently you weren't serious enough to be in a relationship with him, which is why he decided to end things because apparently you didn't officialize the relationship on social media. Okay, I want to take a step back from this point to say, I think it is a valid concern if you've been dating someone and they may not feel comfortable admitting to people around them, including social media, that you're not on there. But bring it up and don't break up with a person just because, you know, you're uncomfortable about this. The mature thing in this circumstance would have been for Benny to go to you and be like, hey, I've noticed that it appears you know, you aren't sharing us on social media. Now, I'm not pressing you to put us on social media, but I guess I was feeling concerned that maybe there was something going on that maybe led you to make that decision. I'm keen to hear because, you know, I'd love it if we could be public about our relationship. Doesn't necessarily have to be on social media, but I just want to make sure that we're, I guess, we're on the same page. I feel like he completely skipped that step and jump to the conclusion, you're clearly not serious about me, so I'm just going to get rid of it. And I feel like this was a justification to find an excuse to basically leave the relationship. I want to take a moment here to say that something to bear in mind when it comes to a case like this is this guy could have a personality disorder. And I only say that because we know that a lot of people who have particularly borderline personality disorder have a tendency to have had very, very volatile upbringings. And this guy's emotional state seems to be one where there's really low self-esteem. That's quite apparent. I wouldn't be surprised if he's also had some suicidal ideation in the past or at least tried acting on it. And I also suspect that, you know, this is someone who is highly, highly impulsive. And it's not to say that those three things exclusively match the criteria for BPD. But we do know from research that people who have a fearful avoidant attachment style tend to be the group of people who are more likely to have personality disorders, particularly borderline personality disorder. Now, in saying that, I can't make that assessment, but something about the way in which this guy 
just turn on you so quickly in this particular way, which I think, to be honest, is highly intense in my opinion, and also couldn't even communicate a lot of this stuff to you, which we know is part and parcel avoidant experiences. No, I think this is more than just a fearful avoidant attacher. I think there's definitely something going on here as well too. Like to me, this man's letting his trauma do all the talking. And it's interesting because you mentioned how you felt the relationship was great, never had a fight. And yet he was basically behaving as if you weren't even accepting of him in this relationship. And to me, it's like, well, bro, Benny, why the fuck didn't you just ask for half of this stuff? If it was really bothering you, just talk about it. Instead, he threw you out like trash and then goes on to, you know, have a new relationship two weeks after breaking up with you. To me, this just feels like he's running from shame and guilt and he's just jumping into someone new. And I also want to say as well that it's interesting how he decided to date you with such a significant age gap. I'm not saying age gap relationships can't work or they're a bad thing, but it's interesting how, you know, avoidance have a tendency to, you know, choose partners where it's almost like, well, you're not really going to get commitment or an intimate relationship here if you choose to date people who are, you know, there's a disparity between the two of you due to compatibility. And I know he's already a dad. I get that aspect. But it seems like your maturity level is way, way higher than his. And, oh, God, I, I suspect he probably would be a very dysfunctional father. And going back to the point about, you know, the age disparity, I think there's something highly emotionally mature about him. And it seems like he was just, you know, getting attached to you without really contemplating and thinking about the potential consequences for this involvement, certainly had a big impact on you. Susan, I think it's really unfair that you've had this experience because it's not okay. He's basically treated you like, you know, you don't even exist and he's just trying to like wipe the memory clean. Now I can see you've got some questions for me. Uh, do you think he's avoidantly attached? Specifically, you know, and a fearful avoidant. And can you explain both the anxious and avoidance side? I assume his anxious side was on um, the part pushing the relationship forward and then the avoidant part appeared when he was triggered. You know, I feel like I partially answered this, but in terms of the anxious and avoidance side, I feel like there was a bit of both going on at the end because I feel like he was looking for anything that was potentially going to be the basis for hurt and betrayal. He jumped onto the fact that you hadn't officialized the relationship on social media amongst a few other things as the basis for which this wasn't going to work. So I feel like that was the hypervigilant part of him looking for something that was going to go wrong. And then the avoidant part was obviously breaking this up as things were getting more intense. So I feel like that was potentially going on. Normally, when I hear of fearful avoidant cases, usually the early stage is beset by a lot of protest behavior where they're constantly asking for reassurance. They want to make sure that you're still into them. And they may be freaking out being like, I don't know if this is going to work out because you're doing long distance with me. You're so much older than me. You're this, you're that. And they're almost wanting you to give them excessive reassurance that you're not going to leave them. And then when that resolves itself, that's when the avoidance side kicks in and they push and push you hard because they're afraid you're going to betray them just like everyone else in their life. And they'd rather get rid of you first before you betray them. I understand it's a trauma thing. I get that aspect, but it's very irrational. And it's just one of those things where they play their loops out. And I'm not saying, and I want to make it very clear. I know it sounds like I'm being sarcastic and mean spirited when I say this to fearful avoidance. Let it be clear. I am sorry that anyone who has a fearful avoidant attachment style has this experience because it sounds like hell. And I know that you probably do deeply care and love about everyone you've probably pushed away. I'm here just to say, it's also held to be on the receiving end of this behavior. So that's how I would describe it there. And yes, he's absolutely, like to me, I, I'm definitely thinking there's definitely some avoidant attachment going on specifically at the end there, because that's ridiculous. At the very least, high levels of emotional immaturity. At worst, there's probably a personality disorder being thrown in the mix too. How would one know they're avoidant unless told by a partner? My understanding is that all of this is subconscious. They don't realize they self-sabotage healthy relationships. They are hypervigilant in finding reasons that the relationship doesn't work. Um, they are finding reasons to support a subconscious idea that their partner will leave or betray them due to a fear of intimacy abandonment and not being good enough. 
Um, okay, so is the question, how would someone like Benny know that they're avoidant unless you told them? Or how would you know that Benny is avoidant until like he was behaving the way he did? To answer the first question, um, Benny, I think probably already knows that he has an intimacy problem. He already admitted that he can't deal with conflict and also struggles to make things right. So it suggests that he's very much aware that there is a problem with him. Uh, if you were the one to want to figure out if he was avoidant from the start, harder question to answer is a lot of this behavior doesn't come out until the you know later stages when things are becoming more intimate. But I do think one thing that is alarming, and you even mentioned it too, is the pace at which this was accelerating and how quickly things evolved. So I think there is a bit of that. Uh, next part. Can you address the uh, pathophysiology of this, uh, of the nervous system? My understanding is that they live in a constant state of anxiety, cortisol, from a lifetime of suppressing their emotions and don't know it. It seems, quote unquote, normal to them. They need dopamine to counteract the cortisol. Do they ever get enough to a partner for any oxytocin bonding? Or is dopamine the only relief for their nervous system? I'm going to be honest and say, I probably don't know if I could provide a good hormonal explanation for what's going on. But the way I understand it is that for a lot of avoidance, they're often not equipped to deal with the big emotions they're feeling inside of them. So because they're, as you mentioned, compartmentalizing and also because they're suppressing their emotions, you know, they're very sensitive to a lot of things, chronic health issues, which I won't go into right now. But I think that for a lot of them, because they're in such hyper states of, you know, well, particularly fearful avoidance of hypervigilance, anxiety, and also depression, I find that a lot of them are trying to find activities that give them dopamine to feel better about themselves. I think they definitely do get oxytocin through the bonding, but I think what activates them is not so much the oxytocin part of it. I think it's more the thing that really begins to freak them out is feeling like there's a degree of dependency on the other partner, meaning that when they start to feel positive feelings for another person and they feel like there's a degree of, I could be dependent on this person, this person could actually really get to know me, that's when the panic starts to hit them like a freight train. That's when they get a lot of, I suppose in this case, a big cortisol rush and also their limbic system where their amygdala is running over time starts to hyperactivate and cause them to floor find, as you said in the previous question. So yeah, it is, that's how I would explain and break it down. To be honest, I would need to study more about, you know, hormones and better understanding this. And I'm sure there are people who have a better understanding of this than me, but that's the way I would explain it with my knowledge at this time. Uh, can you address the nice guy syndrome in avoidance? Oh, great question. My understanding is this is common due to their need for external validation. They need the validation from everyone else of being so nice, but then it feels a little bit fake because of the core wound of defectiveness. They also avoid communicating their own needs because they fear being abandoned and end up resenting you for things that you don't even know about. Okay, so great question. Generally, when it comes to the nice guy syndrome, it's classically a guy who's anxiously attached, who believes that if I'm, basically they have this belief of, I will give you X, Y, Z, and in return, you will give me ABC. I will shower you with love. I will try and claim and own you. And if you do, you'll give me good sex in return and love me and we'll never have any problems. It's a really codependent belief system that basically puts these men in positions where they think that if I go out of my way for this person to rescue, save them from their problems, they'll love me in return, which is not what anyone's usually after. And this can apply to gay men as well. We can also do that too. So it's not exclusive of straight men, bisexual men too, uh, and trans people too. Now, in avoidance, it, it's, it's more of like a white knight syndrome where it's really baffling because unlike the anxious attacher who has covert contracts, the avoidant attacher in this case is looking to try and rescue you from your problems. But then when those problems are solved, they start to resent you and push you away because you're no longer presenting the same level of, you know, issues that you once did before. Both anxious and avoidantly attached nice guys 
suffer from big mother wounds where they're typically trying to not be like their vile fathers. They're trying to show up as the good little boy to their mums. And I think that a lot of the time for the avoidance side, because they do, as you said, feel defective or a bad person, they need that external validation to feel like they're a good person. They're doing the right thing. And I think that when it comes to the validation from everyone else, you know, it does get to a point where it's like, I can kind of see what you're doing is really to prop yourself up because you feel terrible about yourself. So I think that overall, this nice guy is someone who would be characterized by big fear of intimacy, commitment, can't handle conflict. And I mean, generally nice guys of any attachment style can't handle conflict. And typically in this case, can't handle self-reflection and accountability. So it becomes deeply problematic. And I think that often a lot of them just rush in to, you know, to help try and rescue people with big, big, big problems like mental health issues, with eating disorders, et cetera, because this is all they know, which is how to help someone who probably reminds them of a mother who was going through distress as a young, you know, when they were a young child. So a lot of this is just going back to their childhood wounding. Uh, can you address the relationship cycle of infatuation, fault finding, discard? If a relationship is so stressful, then why monkey branch into another one? Do they not see that the new person will eventually trigger them too? Or do they just keep going on the cycle until they find another emotionally unavailable person that they don't really have to connect with? Okay, great question. Uh, so they know they, a lot of them know that they have a problem, but they rationalize it away with the, well, if I find the right person, I won't feel like this. I'll be fine. And a lot of avoidant attachers have a nasty habit of invalidating their own stuff and believing half the BS they tell themselves. So as a consequence, there is a tendency for a lot of them to not see the role they play in this, even though they may recognize they have one that they're contributing to. With the monkey branching, it's really just a way of dealing with their distress off the back of a previous relationship in the hopes that everything will be different in the next one. And if they do find someone who's emotionally unavailable, usually they cheat on the partner. Like it happens almost inevitably. Usually they will get tired because they're not, you know, finding what they were looking for in that relationship. And they will usually do something to sabotage that relationship. So even if they have an awareness that there is a problem inside of them, they will still barrel on ahead to, you know, basically make it seem like I don't have a problem. That was all my ex's stuff. Uh, next question. Do they only run from people they truly care about? Nah. <laughs> they can also run from people who have abused them when the abuse gets to a point where they've had enough of it too. It just depends on what triggers them. If it's the fear of intimacy, they'll push good people away. If they've dealt with enough, you know, crappy behavior from someone, they'll push that person away. But interestingly enough, they're more inclined to go back to the problematic, toxic people because they're still trying to get love and validation from people who will never give it to them. Uh, do they know or ever feel bad about the destruction they leave behind? I think they do, but I think they're masters of compartmentalizing that a lot of them don't really want to sit with that pain. And if they do, it often triggers the shit out of their wounding around being defective, being a bad person. So I think that it, it's one of those things where they're often not wanting to really sit with the shit because it really, you know, spikes a lot of their guilt and shame, which are emotions that avoidance absolutely loathe to sit with. Lastly, why is it so hard to get over the avoidant? I think it's because even as you put it in your message, you know, like in your letter, Susan, this is someone who came to support you when you were, you know, working on your home. You know, this is a guy who was really fully into you before he had a freak out episode and pushed you away. This is a guy who I'm sure in spite of all the crap he put you through at the end, made you feel like he was someone who could be a potential soulmate from here on out. I think part of the reason why these situationships are so devastating is because they are such a source of cognitive dissonance. They are an experience where you often feel like a lot of past hurt and pain, if it's relevant to you, 
gets reactivated where you feel abandoned and betrayed. I think it's also one of those things where there's so much potential and promise with where this was all going before it was lit up in flames. And I also think too that we can really fundamentally relate with these people. Benny had a really tough childhood. You know, I like I said, I am sorry for him what he's been through. And I think it is one of those things where when you've gotten that close to an individual where they're sharing that, it feels like you really got to know them and it feels like you got really close. And it is one of those things where it feels like, you know, you've definitely had such an intensely bonding experience where it's like, I really got to know this person and I felt they got to know me. But I also think too, when you're still in love with a person like this and you have to force yourself to get over them, that makes it really hard. And because their behavior is so jarring at the shutdown deactivation sort of phase, you're left with a lot of confusion. There's more I could go into this too, but the long story short is, oh, they're just so painful and so hard to get over. Anyways, I'm going to round out here. Susan, thank you for sharing this amazing letter. Again, I know it's not written to be amazing, but thank you for sharing your, you know, your story with us. And if anyone else would like to have their letter read, please feel free to submit when submissions are open again, which will be in about mid-October. I'm nearly done with the August, Jesus. I'm nearly done with the September, the September batch. Uh, and feel free to leave us a review on the Ken Reads podcast if this episode or any of them thus far have been of help to you. And I look forward to joining everyone in the very next letter reading soon. <laughs>